Man's journey to the moon was watched by the largest audience in Earth's history. Yet few people knew that the success of the enterprise was made possible by an extraordinary project. The Gemini program was a vital early move in the unofficial international space race. North American Aviation. Frank Borman, please. Astronaut Frank Borman was commander of a space mission designed to test a new craft in Earth orbit, a lunar lander. But the Apollo 8 lander was not yet ready to fly. Then Borman received a secret phone call. It came from his boss, Deke Slayton. CIA satellite photos suggested the Russians were ready to send a man around the moon before the end of the year. In August 1968, Borman was offered a dangerous new assignment. They wanted to know if I thought we could change our mission and take Apollo 8 and go to the moon. I said, great, I'd love to do it, let's go. One of the two men to accompany Borman was Jim Lovell. I was ecstatic. To me, the idea of going uh, to explore a new planet far outweighed the fear of something going wrong. Yet there was much that could go wrong. The spacecraft, the rocket itself, navigating across a quarter of a million miles. Their safe return depended on a single engine. If it failed, the whole crew would be stranded at the moon. The third man on board was Bill Anders. We had accepted these kinds of risks. I thought we had one chance in three of a successful mission, one chance of three of an unsuccessful mission yet surviving, and one chance in three of an unsuccessful mission and not surviving. If they had died, it would have changed our view of the moon forever, knowing their bodies were up there silently circling every two hours, year after year. Two minutes, 10 seconds and counting. Oxidizer tanks in the second and third stages now have pressurized. No human had ever flown more than 800 miles from the Earth. Apollo 8 would travel a half million miles to return from the moon. 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. I was absolutely mesmerized by what was going on. I mean, all of a sudden you find out that, my God, the crew has left the, the Earth's uh, environment. Okay, it's now on a way to another planet for the first time. So, holy cow, this is something. But when future generations look back, they may be surprised to learn why men first went to the moon. Because it was not the ancient drive to explore that inspired the landing mission. Any idea that the Apollo program was a great voyage of exploration or scientific endeavor is nuts. People just aren't that excited about exploration. They were sure excited about beating the Russians. In October 1957, Russia put the first man-made satellite in history into orbit, Sputnik. To many Americans, it was a shocking defeat. Pearl Harbor in space. It is quite possible that an aggressor nation that dominates space will then dominate the world. We just can't let that happen. The 
consider the control of space around the Earth very much like, uh, shall we say, the great maritime powers considered the control of the seas in the 16th through the 18th century. And uh, they say if we want to control this planet, we have to control the space around it. Dr. Werner von Braun was America's leading rocket scientist. A German engineer who created the V-2 rocket in World War II, he later worked for the U.S. Army. For years, von Braun had dreamt of exploring space. Thanks to the Russians, he got his chance. Nine months after Sputnik, President Eisenhower created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. NASA announced Project Mercury, a program to put an American in space. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. The seven Mercury astronauts became instant heroes, Cold War warriors ready to battle communism in space. Men like Alan Shepard, and John Glenn were the public face of America's space program. But even the Mercury astronauts had no idea what was going on behind the scenes at a little-known NASA laboratory. The Langley Research Center in Virginia was where the journey to the moon truly began. Since the 1950s, unnoticed, a tiny group of engineers had already been planning the trips. They were called the Space Task Group, visionaries dreaming the future into being. One of them, Dr. Maxime Faget, became a legend among engineers. He helped to create every American spacecraft, including today's shuttle. In 1958, he was designing the Mercury capsule. We expected to land on the moon sooner or later because it was so close and because everybody could see the moon. It, it, it made a very good target. In the 1950s, travel to the moon was about to become possible because of the rocket. Rockets had become more powerful in order to carry nuclear bombs. Rockets carrying liquid oxygen would burn fuel in an airless vacuum. They could now travel through space. For an astronaut to survive there, he'd need the protection of a spacecraft or capsule. Even a small capsule would need a huge rocket to put it into space. Overcoming gravity took enormous amounts of fuel, so the rocket was divided into stages. As each one burned, its fuel tank dropped away, saving weight. By the time the capsule finally reached space, the rocket that took it there was gone. But NASA were not the only ones with such plans. 